This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello and welcome to Writers on Film. My name is John Bleasdale and today I am going to be talking to Tony Bill. Tony is one of those guests who has to come under the legendary subcategory, I think. Uh, he is a actor who has starred alongside Frank Sinatra, Steve McQueen and Pee Wee Herman amongst many, many others. He's a producer who broke into the big time with his Paul Newman, Robert Redford conman drama The Sting and he's directed a bunch of films himself including most recently Flyboys um, and and he's just had a career that's just gone on and on and absolutely amazing. Um, you, you will hear many things uh in this podcast which will will make you uh which will will make you happy because this this guy's a real insider he's, he's he's worked at every level of the business and this has qualified him to write a book called movie speak how to talk like you belong on a film set it's a lexicon of all the phrases you might hear on a film set um as with loads of surprises as well as some you might know but it's a real education it's a brilliant sort of book to sort of dip into and impress your friends and colleagues and especially if you go on the film set obviously um if you enjoyed the episode please remember to like subscribe and do all those things that you have to do uh then if you wish to follow me on twitter i'm around at dr john t d-r-j-o-n-t-y but before you do any of that just enjoy this conversation which again this is a legendary man and i'm so proud to be able to offer this conversation for you guys. My wife, Helen Bartlett, who's a producer, and I, we were on the set of one of the movies that we did together a long time ago, actually. Um, I think it was on the set of Five Corners. And right. um, we were talking, she was asking me what a certain term meant. And I told her and I started thinking about it. And I, had, and I thought, you know, I, I, I wonder where, where you can find this information. And I discovered that no one had ever written it down, that it was an oral uh, tradition, really. And um, then I, I thought, well, I'll start making a list of, mm. of uh, terms and see see how many you know I I know or I can find and maybe I'll maybe I'll write an article maybe I'll just make a list of these words anyway and it, and then um, I decided well maybe it'd be a book and then I sent the proposal to uh, a, a publisher and they instantly said we love it and let's do it and then but they said but we don't want we don't want just to have a lexicon. We want you to write about yourself and personal experiences and things like that. And I said, oh, no, no I don't want to do that. That's like, I'm, I'm not interested in talking about me. I'm interested in, in doing this research and, and, and finding out what these words come from. They said, no, no, really, really, we want you to kind of at least do a few chapters. So anyway, that's that's how the, the form of it came up. and. And as I say, I, I realized that no one had ever written down this language that we use on the on the movie set, and so um, there was nowhere to research it. I couldn't. I, I had no no written record of most of these terms. So it took me years because what I did was I, when I would direct or produce a movie, uh, or even if I was around somebody who was in the film business. I would use that experience to quiz the crew. And, and if I heard them say something, or if I wondered what something meant or where it came from, uh, then I would talk to people about it. And that that's kind of in keeping with what it is, which is an oral history. And, and you've had so much experience as well. You're, you're sort of quite uh, uniquely positioned in that, that you, you've started off very early on uh, as an actor, right? Yes, and as a matter of fact, uh, now that you mention it, and I, I never thought about this, I don't think I wrote about this, but when I got into the movie business out of college, I was suddenly 
transported to another planet, another country, where people spoke a language that I had never heard before. So on that very first movie, uh, Come Blow Your Horn, uh, I started being fascinated with this language and the, these habits, you know, there are certain things. And because I was a newcomer, because I was the totally inexperienced kid on the movie set, the crew kind of took me under their wing and they would say, now don't, don't do this and you do that and here's how we do. So uh, even then I, I was taught a little bit more than I might have if I hadn't been so fresh. How, how old were you when you first started? I turned 21 or 22. Um, what was it? I turned 22 uh, during pre-production. Yeah, just out of college and, and you're in this major sort of Hollywood situation and they're a, a major film and, uh, and you're surrounded by all these sort of protocols and etiquette and this language that you don't understand. Exactly right. And of course, everybody was much older and more experienced than I too. So I was, I was in, in, a, in a group of old, what would normally be old timers, although they were probably all in their 30s or 40s. <laughs> they seem old. They seem old to a 22 year, year old. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so they take you under the, the, the wing and you have. Did, did you find that like other actors also had the ha, had this code, had these had these words down or, or were some of them just sort of drifting through without without necessarily being interested in that side of it? No, most most actors uh, have a lim have a limited uh, kind of uh, lexicon. They have a kind of a limited vocabulary because you, you don't need to know a lot of the the lingo that the crew uses. You know, when so to speak, behind your back. You know that mm. they, they they talk to themselves uh, with this language. They don't really need to talk to the actors about it. So the actors tend not to hear a lot of it. But on the other hand, the actors do hear, you know, some phrases constantly, you know, cheat, cheat, or, you know, whatever it is. And and some directors and some sets ha have their own little uh, versions of, of language, you know, but, but basically th these are the words that are kind of universal. They're so universal that they, they translate into other languages, that, you know, Exactly. People use them in other languages. I think you mentioned the some of the phrases that actors uh, have to be aware of. Like, um, well, cheat is the is um, sort of the most uh, one of what well, I imagine one of the most commonly used. Banana was a good one. That was one I didn't know. A good one. Yeah. You said banana left or banana right. Now, you know, some of these terms are are are, are rare. You know, they're not mm. they're not everybody uses them all the time so that's why it was so hard to to compile them because uh, I had it took me 10 or 12 years of being on sets and paying attention to uh, to, to realize that oh I have I haven't heard that one before or I, I know that one but I haven't written it down or where do you think it comes from or where might it come from and that's so it's very complex just for a simple word some of them are very, are very sort of when you let's say the banana is the the sort of curved on that slightly unnatural curved movement you you walk in order to cover something or to approach yeah, the exactly. camera more closely right exactly yeah act, actors you know the people in the audience don't realize that um that film acting it entails quite a few artificial uh, moves or artificial situations uh, that, that only make it more real when it's on film. So cheating your look or bananaing or, uh, you know, what, whatever it is that, that the, the, the actor has to do to, to, to be seen doing what they're doing yeah yeah and even the, um, I, I love the because in within the language you you have these cheats as well don't you I, what was the one i forget the name now but it was french something and it was about um how you set up a lighting you set up the so shoot with a, french, a french reverse that's yeah. right french reverse yeah could you explain that one for our listeners well, let's see. I got to make sure I'm I'm looking at it here correctly. Yeah. Well, a French reverse is uh, when instead of turning the camera around and shooting the other side of a scene, or basically usually of a person, 
you just put the furniture, rearrange the furniture in the background or the, or the background itself. You know, you can't, you can't rearrange, you know, the, the uh, view of the ocean. But if you have a wall behind you with a painting on it or, or, a, or even a person, you can just, um, instead of turning the whole camera around and relighting the scene from that point of view, you can just change the background. Yeah, yes, and, and, it's, uh, and it, you save a lot of time and money by doing that. Uh, yes, you save a huge amount of time and money. I, I was reading about Terence Malick uh, filming Days of Heaven, and he would use a cheat of, um, of of basically filming dialogue facing one way and then just swap the actor and film in exactly the same direction without moving the camera. So in the finished film, it looked like they were talking to each other, standing opposite each other, but he was just using the light as best as he could because he knew he didn't have that much light. That's right. He, he they did that movie with a lot of natural lighting, so you 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 can't stop with the sun. So when you have the sun shining where you want it, it's easier to to put people in different in the same position rather than change the sun. I love those stories. I love that idea of just you know those improvised cheats, as you as you say. Um, one of the other sort of types of phrase that um, that 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 runs all the way through the book is when uh, a particular rule is named after a particular actor or director. So yeah. um, some of these, like the Clint Eastwood rule, is very you know specific to a to a, to a problem or an idea. But then there's others like the Doris Day parking space, I think. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, that, that now in these days, you that, that that's kind of an obscure term. Um, but uh, I heard I heard the other day of a, a saying, "Rock star parking." You know, a parking place you park wherever you want. <laughs> others are named, you know, uh, not named, but others are, are are hard to replicate today. The the Gary Coleman was uh, was one that I found funny as well. Yeah, which what was which, the Gary, the Gary Coleman? Coleman's like a stand, yeah. a short stand, and so that, it's oh yeah oh that's yeah that's kind of a, a, a you know the the crew tends to invent rude slang it's it, it, it's usually it usually has to do with the times and places that they're in so i tried to avoid that in the book because those are transitory you know those come in and out of fact people don't know what they're talking about usually there's just a few of them that that refer to 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 people of of note but mm. not not much not much Tell us a little bit more about your career then, because you, you moved from acting and you went into, you, you sort of went behind the camera and went into production, yeah. right? Yeah, I, um, right, out of, right out of school, right out of, out of college, I, I got this job, as we were saying, basically starring in a movie. Mm. So I was thrust into the center of the culture as well as the, the work itself. And um, it was, it was a, very interesting experience it was not exactly the fulfillment of a life's dream for me because i hadn't always dreamed of being in the movies i actually wasn't even a movie fan particular mm. particularly so um it was a it was a new experience for me not as much a fulfillment of, of a dream and so it turned out that being a movie star was not my idea of a great way to live your life mm. and so uh i i I started on that set with Bud Yorkin and Norman Lear, who were the producer and director. I started talking about things that interested me, not not the movies as much as other things that were about the movies. And they encouraged me. They said, you know, you, you should look if you want to if you want to make movies or you think this would be a good movie, come to us and talk to us about it. So I started. I started. I I, I was encouraged to talk about what I thought might be an interesting subject or an interesting book or an interesting play uh, for, for a movie. Because in those days, this is in the early 60s, movies were made from books or plays. They weren't mm. generally made from original screenplays. There were some original screenplays, but nothing like what we see now. So I, on the other hand, not knowing any better, wondered why why hasn't anybody made a movie about this subject or that subject why hasn't anybody made a movie from this obscure book not a bestseller 
mm. uh, so on and so forth. And as I mentioned this to my friends or you know my contemporaries, who at the time were the Steven Spielbergs and Francis Coppolas and Terry Malick's, um, my friends, people mm. my age who were not established in the movie business at all, I saw, I saw them agree with me. Yeah, that would make a good movie. Or yeah, that's a great subject, right? And so they started enthusing about them. And so I thought, well, maybe I know more than I think I do, or maybe I'm, you know, not know more. But maybe I'm more attuned to this strange business than I thought I was. And maybe my ideas aren't so dumb as they might be or not so outside the norm. And so um, I thought, you know, I'm going to I'm going to try to make a movie. I'm going to try to indulge my tastes. So I the first one I I think that I undertook was I wanted to make a film about the world of big rig truck driving, the guys who drive their trucks across the country. And there's a whole subculture of language again when we're talking about words there's a whole subculture of language and habits and rules and regulations and, and especially music there's a whole uh world of country and western music about truck driving and i had met a young man who's my age you know we were both in our 20s who i liked a lot and we we shared our tastes we shared common interests and so um I thought he'd be a great guy to write this. And his name was Terry Malick. Right. And so uh, I went to a friend, of, another friend of mine who, who knew me and my tastes, who was a sailing friend of mine. And he had become head of the of brothers. And so um, I said, I'd like to hire this unknown writer to write a script about a subject that nobody's ever tackled before, which is big rig truck driving. What do you think? And here's what I want to do and so on. And so he agreed with me. Uh, his name was John Kelly, hmm. and he um, he thought it was, it was a good idea. And, and that's how my first movie got made as a producer. It was a disaster. I made the two biggest mistakes a producer can make, which is I hired the wrong director and I didn't fire him. <laughs> I stuck by him. I, 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 you know, I stuck to the code of the movie business at the time, which is you know a producer supports his director mm. through thick and thin. At any rate. That was how I got my first movie made, and then that led to other equally kind of original screenplays. I, I haven't made movies out of books or plays, only out of original for, and actually usually first time writers. And so, and so with that, did did you regret not not uh, directing that film yourself? No, I regret not getting Terry to direct it. But he was a first timer too, so. It, you know, I hired a first-time director, and I couldn't figure out how to replace him with another first-time director. So you started with Deadhead Miles, which, was, which, as you say, was a success. Yeah. It didn't even get a release, right? As Paramount just sort of buried it. Not much of one. Yeah. Right. It was an offbeat movie. You know, it was a very offbeat movie. You know, first of all, Terry's a very offbeat writer, so the, you know it needs special care. And secondly, the director did a terrible job, and mm. so. It, it didn't it didn't live up to its potential as a script but um it was it was the first and i, I managed to survive it <laughs> right and so that was a stepping stone to your next i mean that was you you, you sort of could continue yeah. in the business yeah and it, and it took me a long time to to want to, to really feel like i was qualified to direct a movie too i i wasn't instantly like many people of my generation were i didn't feel confident enough i didn't feel privileged enough i didn't feel responsible enough i guess to say give me millions of dollars to spend as i see fit which is really what you're asking when you're when you ask to direct a movie that's what you're asking i mean one that that's my attitude now mm. another person's attitude is i wrote this i'd be the best director for it or i love this subject i'm being i'm the best director or, uh this is the story of my life i should be directing it uh, I, I don't feel that way i feel like you're asking you're asking somebody to give you millions of dollars and you're the one responsible for how you spend it uh no matter what kind of controls they they may have you're the one that says hey, one more take or that's good enough or like let's shoot this in the dark whatever it is all these decisions are are spending other people's money the way you feel like spending it that's a lot of responsibility but but at the same time you've you've sort of um 
you, you were acting in films for 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 a good period of time so you you must have had experience as well observing directors and seeing what they did you know i asked myself if i learned anything mm. that that's why it took me so long to direct a movie i did i worked with some great directors i went some famous directors and some big movie stars and and you know and i worked with these people and i like to think that i learned something i like to think that i paid attention on the set that i got to know them that i but when it comes down to it after several years after i think maybe six or seven years of acting and of producing a bunch of movies i said to myself i don't know if i i don't think i know anything hmm. i just you know i, I I don't feel like I know anything. And coming from a, a largely tense academic background, I said to myself, there's only one way to know if you've learned anything, and that's to take a test, right? That's what you do when you're in, in school. You mm. to find out if you've learned the curriculum, you take a test. So the test is directing a movie. So I, th I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to give myself the ultimate test if I should stay in the movie business because I really don't feel like I belong here. I'm really not cut out to be famous. I'm not cut out to be, you know, uh, an actor. Uh, being a producer is is kind of waiting for somebody else to tell you they're going to make your movie. It's 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 having the responsibility without the pleasure. I don't know. Lot. So I thought I'm going to give myself a test and direct a movie. Mm -hmm. And if I do a good job, I'm going to stay in the movie business. If I don't, if I can't do a good job, then that's a sign that I haven't learned anything. And I'm not so sure I shouldn't change businesses while I can and become an architect, for example, with something which interested me or become uh, something that I, I feel passionate about because I just don't think I know anything. Mm -hmm. And that's how I directed my, my first movie is actually a short film and it turned out quite well. And that was my encouragement, main encouragement. And then my bodyguard turned out very well too. So I thought, well, I guess I found something that I can do and I can claim to know what I'm doing, even though even there, you don't feel like you know what you're doing. <laughs> it, it sounds like you're, suff you're suffering from the Dunning-Kruger effect, but the, op the, the opposite way around where you've, yeah. you know, coming from an academic background as well, you, you know, you, you have uh, more awareness of what you don't know than, yeah, than, than, than the average person. Exactly. And so I, I to answer your question in, in, a, in a short way, I don't know what I learned from working with Francis Coppola or Sidney Pollack or Sir Carol Reed or all these people that I should have learned something from. I don't know what I learned. Well, what about fellow actors in, in that that environment? Did did you because you said earlier you sort of didn't feel, um, you know, in in that environment you didn't feel necessarily this was where you wanted to be. Uh, did you get on with them or yeah? You know, I mean, because you had you were acting with like Rock Hudson, Frank Sinatra, Steve McQueen, a whole bunch of of the top stars of the time. Yeah, I. Um... I got along with them very well. They were all very nice to me, very kind and very uh, uh, generous and, and, you know, I, I think uh, patient with me because I don't think I'm a very good actor. I wouldn't ever cast myself in something. So here these people had, had to put up with this young guy who's like minimally talented at best. So I, yes, they were all lo lovely to me. I really, I don't think I ever had a confrontation or a argument or a put down from many of these people and, and in fact i i did get along with them very well mcqueen especially mcqueen and i became really good friends he we sh we shared uh, passions for cars and mm. airplanes right and so we had a we had a real bond there um even though we were from such different worlds and and living in different you know different orbits but um McQueen, uh, when I directed that first little short film um, called The Ransom of Red Chief, I thought it turned out pretty well. And so I optioned a script, a first time writer, to see if that might be my first film. And I sent the script to Steve McQueen hmm. because it was very good casting for him. It was, it was a construction worker. And so I sent him the script. He uh, said, I really like this script. And I said, and well, and, and here's this little short film I directed. And he, and, he, and he calls me back and he says, that movie's really good. You're really a good director. Let's do it. So I thought, oh my God, my first 
directing job, I'm going to have Steve McQueen, the biggest star in the world. He wants to do it. And he was part of a company at the time, and the head of his company wouldn't let him do it. Oh, <laughs> so, man. So much for him. So close, but so far. Yeah. That's, wow. Well, that happens in my business. You know, if, if I were ever to research and write another book, I, one of the things I would like to do is a book about uh, first, what would this, how would I put it? Original casting. Mm. Who originally wanted to do this movie but couldn't do it? Who did they want but wasn't available? Who did they want who turned them down? And how did it come to be that, you know, you name you name it, Robert Redford, Paul Newman, Steve McQueen wasn't in their movie. And but instead they got somebody who was even better that you can't even imagine that that movie could have been made with the person they really wanted at first. And almost I, almost every movie, I, I dare say, has gone through an actor or two or three that they couldn't get. Their first choice, their first choice didn't work out. And they're so lucky they didn't get their first choice. Yeah, they're just sort of the Ronald Reagan in Casablanca or Frank Sinatra in Dirty Harry. Yeah, there's a long list of, of almost casts, you know. Mm. And um, it's interesting how, how I, I tell my students uh, often when they're talking about casting, one of the movies of, of my youth that, as an actor that I was up for and I was aware of was Midnight Cowboy. Oh, right. So Midnight Cowboy, John Schlesinger, I met him for that movie. And every young actor in town met John Schlesinger to be in that movie. So, so John Schlesinger ended up wanting an actor named Michael Sarazen, who was a contemporary of mine and a very good actor and um, Michael Sarazen was under contract to Universal and so in those days actors were sometimes under contract to a studio and if you wanted an actor who was under contract to that studio you had to make a deal with the studio hmm. to get the actor and pay the actor and you know they negotiated the deal and you paid the studio because they were already paying the actor on a weekly or monthly basis. So Universal wouldn't let Michael Sarazen or ask too much money for Michael Sarazen. And so John Schlesinger said, okay, well, the hell with it. I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go with an unknown. I'm going to go with this kid, John Voight. That's how cast, that's how, how kind of nebulous and how kind of fragile casting is. If they had gotten their first choice, if they had gotten Michael Sarazen, we wouldn't be talking about that movie. Not mm. that Michael Sarazen wasn't a good actor, but he was nothing like John Voight was. And conversely, who knows what his career would have been like if he hadn't gotten the role in in Midnight Cowboy. So it's a very fragile world we 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 live in and deal in, in especially in casting. Mm. And uh, there, some people get lucky like I did and get cast instantly some people spend the in effect a lifetime waiting for that role like another example is Harry Dean Stanton I don't know if you know who he is oh was. yeah is Harry that... Dean Stanton right I mean one of our great movie actors mm, absolutely not a, not a leading man you know a quirky guy he, everybody every actor in Los Angeles knew who Harry Dean was before the world knew he was everybody's like oh man he's such a good actor why is, i hope he gets it and he finally starred in a movie uh, a couple of months before his death he his last movie i think it was called lucky it was and yeah it, yeah right it's a wonderful movie he's great in it of course but that's how long harry dean waited to get that role to have a proper lead role in a in a film yeah that, that's amazing that's amazing he's such a there's a new documentary i just watched with him in it and uh and it's uh just about his life and you and to hear him singing as well he's got a beautiful voice and he sings yes. these uh spanish uh, language sort of mexican songs that are you know yeah He's got a real passion yeah, you know, for. You know more. You know more about movies than any ten people I know. <laughs> well, I interviewed the director of that film. I'm trying to remember what his name is. He was in Zodiac. He was. He played uh, one of the suspects in Zodiac. I'm just going to uh, Google it. Uh, John Carroll Lynch. I, I, I hadn't even Googled it. It just came back. Just just typing made it. It's, um, he's called John Carroll Lynch. Did a great job. And uh, I've got a feeling it might have even been his first film as a director. 
because he's, as I say, he's a principally right. an actor. That, that reminds me a little bit as well of watching uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and the fact that it's set in that era, but you've got that um, yeah. DiCaprio character basically one or two steps down from Steve McQueen, and he could have got The Great Escape. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, I, that movie... Um... I have to my have the big tip of my hat to that movie that I guess few people who are not my age and in my and my geography of being here and living in Hollywood that movie so captured and so accurately captured the the time and place of mm-hmm. Hollywood in the early 60s most people won't won't realize it because they weren't around and living in Hollywood at the time I mean you can admire it for feeling like it captures the time but I'm here to tell you, it it extraordinarily uh, accomplished uh, a replication of that time. So well, they spent a lot of time and money and trouble on that movie, doing something that only like three of us <laughs> appreciate. <laughs> did you find the behind the scenes stuff uh, accurate as well? Yeah, mm. I did. If mm. I remember correctly, I, I only I saw that movie in two parts because my daughter was in the hospital that night and i was waiting to find out if, if they if an operation worked and there mm. was I, I couldn't do anything i was stuck so i i went to the movie and i waited for the phone call and the phone call came halfway through the movie so mm. i only watched the movie halfway through and then i left and then I came back and watched the other half. You had your your big break um, as a producer with The Sting, is that right? Well, that was that was the the big success. Mm. The, after after the the failure of Dead End Miles, I met a writer who had written a script called Steelyard Blues. I thought it was I thought it was really talented, but really difficult to get made and really not not an obvious commercial subject and so um, I set about to option Steelyard Blues and commission a movie called which would end up being called The Sting it didn't have a title because I said I I met with him his name is David Ward Mm. I said David you know I love this script Steelyard Blues but I don't know if I can possibly tackle it but what do you want to do next and he gave me like a two minute little pitch about I want to do this movie about con men in the 20s or 30s and uh it's about a guy a young guy who gets to, uh, whose best friend gets killed by a con man and he decides to con the guy out of every dollar he's got mm. that was it so that's that's how the thing was born and uh it, you know it, it, the script is a really good script and and so the the script of steel yard blues is we got it made actually I didn't think we would, but we got it made. So it's Donald Sutherland, yeah. right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I remember that film. I saw it a few years ago, but it's um it's quite. I mean, again, a little bit like Deadhead Miles. It's 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 got a sort of quirky kind of anti-establishment. Uh, you know, Jane Fonda and Donald Sutherland, and you know, uh, Peter Boyle. It's it's a little bit goofy, right? And so very delicate subject matter yeah yeah i mean it's, it's sort of it's it's funny watching that uh, those sort of late 60s early 70s fil- 70s films now because they're so sort of plugged into their time yeah yeah you know something anyway, those, those are my first first producing efforts and and when you were when you as a producer and and in terms of you know to bring it back a little bit to the book as well did you find yourself in a in another kind of language is that was that a, a totally different um sort of world or did you find yourself on set quite a lot how 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 were you in terms of your involvement with the films everyone every film was different it, i in in terms of one's image of producing on many of them i was kind of what is it called a, a first mover or something like that you know, i create i worked i got this my 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 biggest accomplishment so to speak is is finding material that's original fresh and in my case almost always the first script ever written or the first script produced mm. by its author i I'm very attracted to first timers. At the actual in the during the actual making of the movie, every movie was different. On Taxi Driver, which is a film that my partners and I optioned, my partner Michael Phillips was there all the time, and mm-hmm. I wasn't. I, I didn't even take a cr- uh, producing credit on that movie. I said, you know, I'm, I'm not I, I, I'm not comfortable with 
being a producer. So it's just a, a Bill Phillips, you know, my last name production. And right. Their last name. On each movie, um, I think the movie that I had the most hands on daily, be there, argue with the director, be a real presence was uh, Hearts of the West, which was second time, first time script, second time director. And, um, and as it turns out, without knowing, without realizing it, kind of an autobiographical movie for me to do, because it's about a kid from the Midwest who, who's like totally naive, comes to Hollywood to be a writer and stumbles upon a movie set, a Western movie set, which ends up making him into a movie star. So right. it was, it, it, and falls under the tutelage of an old timer. Uh, so it, it has a kind of a resonance to me as, a, as a tale that I relate to. But in fact, it was somebody else's script, that, you know, a young writer who would never written a script before. And um, second time director, Howard Zeef, who was a really interesting funny oh. yeah howard comes from came from the, the world of, of commercials where he was the king of commercials he was a hugely successful commercial director but i found uh, we had conflicting styles if nothing else whereas you know how we got to get we got to get the the way days work done you can't spend all day looking you know casting extras mm -hmm. or you got to go look at locations we we can't we got to pick the location for tomorrow or next week so I was I was like the you know the the director of the director in a sense uh, as a producer. So my responsibility I, I felt my responsibilities and I didn't enjoy and I don't enjoy kind of being the the boss mm. so to speak. But on that movie I was the kind of the, the image of a producer, which is like we got to get this done. We got to get we don't have enough money for that. We don't have this. You got to go do this. We have to do this. So that's that's a movie that I I really used my production experience on more than I needed to. And that's uh, starring a young young Jeff Bridges as well. Yeah, Jeff was great in it. Great mm. in it. Jeff Bridges, mm. by the way, speaking of casting, if we had cast The Sting the way it was written, and if I had, if I could make it, imagine right now who we would have cast, we would have cast Jeff Bridges and Lee Marvin as those two guys. That's, yeah, that's the way the script was written. The script was written about a young, almost innocent, naive kid who, whose best friend, is, whose friend is killed, and decides to go after the guy who killed him by conning him. And he goes to the this retired geezer, doesn't even want to do it anymore, and talks him into helping him do it. Now the movie casts Redford as the kid and Newman as the geezer. Well, you won't remember, but there are several points in the movie, in the in the Sting, where Newman refers to Redford as kid. He says, "We're not as smart." Redford says, "We're not as we're not as smart as we think we are." And Newman says, "You never are, kid." Well, that's just a vestige of, of the of the language of the script that he calls him kid because they're almost the same age. So ideally, ideally in casting, it would have been Jeff Bridges and Lee Marvin. Yeah. And I often, re I often kind of regret that it's not. Yeah, I could definitely see it. Yeah, I could definitely see a, a, a great version of the Sting with those two in the in the main roles. Yeah. So mm. you never know. You never know when you start to make a movie. You just never know how it's going to turn out. You never know who's going to be in it. You never know if you made the right choices on a daily, hourly basis but sometimes you do <laughs> william goldman's maxim you know nobody knows anything yeah yeah relating to that did have you been sort of uh, have there been times in your career where you've you've been really su uh, surprised at sort of the reception of a film 100 mm. percent. i think you know uh to you to continue the sting analogy i one of my best friends was a a, a really smart producer producer uh, not a successful one but a really smart one and so when we screened mm. the sting for the first and only time for the public we I invited him to come to the screening with me and, and I'm, I'll never forget we walked out of the screen and uh, it was like well how'd you like I don't know how do you what do you think what do you think what do you and I said I think it'll do well uh, I think if we're lucky it'll do kind of kind of almost Butch Cassidy business. And Butch Cassidy was pretty successful, but Sting was much more successful. So you, even after you see it, you don't know, much less all the way along the way. 
And then there's the movies, you know, mm. that you think are going to be successful and they bomb. And it's just, I don't, I don't know. I think there are people, I think, who I think they have enthusiasm more than more than instincts. But there are people that kind of think the movie's going to be do as well as it does. The story that I think il illustrates that was David, uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. Who was head of Paramount for a while? Doesn't matter. Somebody asked him. Doesn't matter. He, somebody asked him as he was re retiring from being head of Paramount. How do you? How do you think? You know, you did. How do you, what do you think of your legacy? He says, "I'll tell you what. If I had made all the movies I turned down and turned down all the movies I made, it would be the same. It would be." Wow. A <laughs> so that's that's where he came down on being able to call your successes. And I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Looking back on it, I might say the same thing. You know, if I had, if I made some of the movies that I read and passed on, or if I had passed on some of the ones that I made, I think I'd be about the same. It gets to that point where, you know, I mean, there are some, the, those books by, uh, you know, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, that idea of uh, lots of experts basically don't do as well as a 50-50, you know, just random yeah. choice. You know, they, they, they don't perform a, a, as well as that, even, even to the point of things like, um, you know, heart surgeons and, you know, should we operate, shouldn't yeah. we? And the expert consultants don't don't you know their results are exactly the same as random you know that's right you know and, and by, by the way i haven't made that many movies that i can i can claim to even be part of that that club david picker is the guy i'm thinking about he's a wonderful producer um yeah uh, you know i i had lunch the other day with with my old friend mike metavoy and we were talking about movies that he's had a hand in and his his list of movies is like endless that as a producer or as a mm. studio head or as a, you know people that he he claims responsibility for i mean that now that's that's a record you can kind of, kind of decide whether you you should have made this one or it shouldn't have made that one and he's he's sort of um his his idea is that a third of them are great a third of them are okay and a yeah. third of them are terrible yeah. it's just like you know that's the the division that's about I, I, I'm, I think that's probably pretty accurate one thing is sure no one bats a, a thousand as they say in baseball no one makes hit after right. hit and no one makes uh even success after success or even really a really good movie all the time spielberg spielberg's got some movies that that barely saw the light of day yeah i mean spielberg d definitely sort of has a great batting average yeah. to continue the metaphor but uh, but at the same time you sort of you do think well after a certain point you've got all the advantages That's as true. well you know um so you you should have made a better movie than right the right. bfg or you know. But, you had everything yeah. available to you. Come on, yeah. man, do better. <laughs> sorry, sorry but Stephen. But that answers your question, though. About do you know it's going to be a you know do you do you know it's going to be a success? I I don't. I think everybody you know. There's an old there's an old saying in the movie business that that is it's not appropriate, but but people say it. They say nobody nobody sets out to make a bad movie, and that, that's kind of a lame excuse mm. for making a bad movie. But it's true. You don't set out to make a movie saying, "Oh, I'm going to make this. It's going to be going to be crappy." You do set out often to say, "This is never going to succeed. We're going to do it anyway." Steve, uh, you know, uh, the guy I I knew that was the the embodiment of that attitude, apart from me, is Sidney Pollack. Sidney thought, and I'm not every. I didn't talk to him about every movie, but, but I was good friends with him. We talked his movies a lot. And Sidney was just sure that something was never going to work. I mean, the perfect example was he was so miserable. I remember making um, Tootsie. He thought that he he was suicidal mm. over Tootsie. He thought it was never, ever, ever going to work. It was a disaster. Didn't get along with Dustin Hoffman. Didn't think it was going to be funny. It was a kind of absurd premise. And of course, it's a one of the great movies and he also felt the same about uh, the way we were yeah he, he didn't have an ending for the way we were he didn't know how to make the movie he didn't think it was going to work so well you just kind of the train is on you're on the train you know you just can't get off once you start making the movie and and it becomes and it becomes obvious to you and 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 horribly apparent that you never should have started this thing you just never we never should have started doing this movie 
<laughs> there's no cure for it. It's going to be a disaster. I'm, my career is over, uh, yet I have to finish it. And th this is a very common feeling, very common. I mean, among all artists, too. I mean, you can ask songwriters and poets and painters. But, but in the movies, it's particularly uh, weighty because you, you're, you've got hundreds of people working on a movie. You've got millions of dollars at stake. You've got a lifetime of reputation of your own and other people. And you and you wake up at night and you say, "There's no way anybody's going to go see this movie. It's just, it's a disaster. You just have to muscle. Through. You just have to go ahead and finish it. And but this, this is very common. And then there are there's another school too, which is at least mm. a, a, I have to believe that is the people who think everything's going to be a hit. This is great. This movie is great. We're doing great. All right, my actors are great. Mm. The script is working. We're you know and there are directors who, who feel that way and um, they're not always right either. Who? <laughs> yes. Could you think of an example uh, of one of those? Mark Rydell. Very, very enthusiastic. Right. Yes. There's not many though. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's more glass half empty. Uh... Yeah. Well, it's a way of looking at life too, as you say, glass half empty, you know, you know like, and, and it's, it's wonderful in a way to, to be enthusiastic all the time. I, I would bet that if you did a, a poll mm. of directors, uh, you would find that uh, almost all of them just just feel like if I can just get through the day, one more day, I just got to get tomorrow's work, today's work done, <laughs> and then tomorrow's, and then we'll worry about it and we we'll save it in the editing room, which is pretty true, by the way. I mean, that's how movies work. I mean, you, you spend all these days and nights in misery just physically miserable because it's so difficult getting up and going to work and doing everything and answering all the questions doing it on doing it and then you you need to you need to go back and put it all together in a way that makes it better than it would have been so uh i i, I think i i mentioned it in the book my my experience with an actress who uh, who kept coming to work every day with with she knew all her lines and she knew what she was motivated by and she knew what she was going to do and i kept saying you know you, you don't need to do that on a movie it's not like a play and you know we're, we're not making a movie here on mm. on the set we're just shooting a lot of film we're just shooting a lot of stuff good stuff bad stuff accidental stuff stuff we mm. never thought we'd do stuff we've rehearsed and then we're going to go back to la and we're going to i'm going to make a movie out of all that stuff and that's how they're made. People don't understand that. George Lucas said, I shoot things so I have something to, to edit. <laughs> that's good. By the way, I, I just saw a lovely documentary uh, about the making of uh, uh, American Graffiti. If you haven't seen it, it's, mm. it's out there on YouTube, I think. Uh, it's, a, it's a little uh, like an hour long doc uh, about the making of that movie. And it's really such a great lesson in wow. how fragile it is to cast and make a movie especially one that doesn't contain uh movie stars you know commercial elements it's original fresh it's a real uh, at how long it took to get that movie made how many times it was canned uh it's a lovely little documentary. You'll love it. It's it's great. And you, when you, so you were producing throughout the seventies, and you started directing in the eighties. But you were still appearing in in films, still acting in roles all the way through, right? You were you were in Shampoo, yeah. with uh, the Hal Ashby film, and that was a total accident. I have no idea why anybody would cast me in okay. something. Uh, it, it would it would pop up every every few years. Somebody would want me to do something, or I would do something. It was just, I don't know why in the world they ever thought of me for something. In terms of shampoo, that was that was um, less of an accident in a way. They they had started shooting, I believe, they, or they're ready to shoot or started shooting that movie. They needed to replace the actor that they had originally cast. And, and I... Oh, right, I, I see. Warren Beatty knew me uh, enough to kind of know me you know i mean just you know we had met the the role was of a tv producer and for w whatever reason 
somebody said, well, how about Tony? You know, maybe he maybe he can act in this thing, and he's he is a producer, and he kind of looks like the guy. Should, you know, all of these little, this confluence of accidents happened at, all at once, and so uh, and I was available because I had just finished shooting mm. uh, uh, Hearts of the West, and so I got invited to the party. And it was great. That's a, that's such a great film. That's a, a really, uh, again, a real film of its time, but but one that I guess it is. I got to look at it again. Uh, I, it's it's weird because it's one of those films where you think you're, Warren Beatty is the is the star. It's you know Warren Beatty and Judy Christie, but I end up having real sympathy for Judy Christie's husband. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, I'm not sure if that husband or her, her older establishment sort of guy. Jack Warden. Jack Warden is the funniest person. You know, when you're making a movie, one of the one of the fun things about acting in a movie is that uh, a lot of the time you're not doing anything. You're sitting around. So um, sitting around with Jack Warden was the funniest experience I've ever had, being on the set with him. Oh, yeah, exactly. Stories and just fun. A funny, funny guy. I always think that about some um, some actors. Whenever there's an actor who seems to be getting a lot of work and appears to be in everything, I always think to myself, I bet they give good lunch. Yep. I bet they, I bet they're the they just they're good to be around. So so it's like, yeah, let's get him on board again. If we're going to spend twenty weeks in Mexico, we might as well do it with so and so. You're so right. There's nothing nothing better than to be amused. You know, th- th- there's another book, by the way. When you're sitting around on a set, not just with actors, with with the grips, you know, with the camera, you hear stories because they've all worked on other movies. They've all worked with other people. They've all had adventures. And this, and a, a book called something like Tales from the Crew, right, would be so amusing, it's so much fun because they're talking about stuff that that they they're not they're they're, they're privileged to talk about. They're, there, there are stories that you never hear in public about the actors they've worked with or the directors or, or just the day that they had to get through and, and do something. They, uh, they're they the best stories. That would be amazing. I've got a horrible feeling everybody will be, uh, you know, lawyered up and NDAs will have to be signed and all the rest of it. So you won't get them, them like you used to with Once Upon a Time, but... But wow, that would that would be great. I remember talking to someone and they told me about an actor and they they started telling me nicknames of people that the crew had for certain actors, and and I can't repeat any of that because it would be it would definitely be libelous. I know, I know. I I don't think you could do it justice, but it would really be fun to write that book. And then you, I mean, and another film in your uh, because it's just like that filmography is so uh, fun. Yeah, I mean, you have Pee Wee's Big Adventure, which I thought, you know, wow, I love that movie. There's another accident. There's what... another accident of casting. Why? How did they want me to do that? Well, what happened was my friend Bob Shapiro was producing it when he first read the script. He sent me the script and asked me what I thought of it and if I would be interested in directing it. And I said, this is not for me. This is a wild script. But when it came back, ended up mm. getting it made, they did the same thing. You know, who are we going to get to play the head of the studio? Oh, well, Tony Tony can act like a studio head. Let's get him. So that was that was another completely accidental uh, casting call that just happened and you but i mean it must be great because it gives you the opportunity to work with work with so many you know great people as well and it's like yeah. uh i don't know it's like a, an old pro keeping his hand in well that's and that's kind of true and but i'll tell you something else about it that interested me for a, another kind of e- equally quixotic reason somebody thought of me for a movie uh, for television which is a, a film about a a a, a guy, a nice guy, who turns out to be a murderer, right? And so that was the role. Mm. So that was, that was good casting for me. And they were doing it and for whatever reason. They they thought of me, and I said, great. And so when I went to do it, I thought, you know, I'm always telling young actors, you know, when I when I work with non actors or first time actors, I have a kind of mantra, which is don't let me catch you acting so mm, you know right and then you can you can talk to non-actors that way we can't talk to a real actor that way so i thought i'm going to take my i'm going to take my own advice on this movie i'm going to show up and i am not going to do anything i am not going to act i am not going to try to impress the director i'm not going to try to 
be a give a good performance i'm just going to show up and say the lines and if if the director says we'll do more or do less or do something different then i'll do it but but i'm gonna i'm gonna free myself of any thought of ever working again because right. every actor has a little devil on their shoulder saying you better be good you better give a good performance you better be great or you're not going to work again you're never going to work again if you're bad you're you had it. So I, I was free of that pressure. I, I didn't care if I ever worked again as an actor. And so I said, I'm just going to show up, say my lines and go home. And if you know anything else, the director will ask me to do, I'll do it. And that's what I did. And I was really good. I thought to myself, I thought, you know, you never like yourself. You know, no, no actor likes to watch themselves and, and you're, you always hate. Them. And so, but I looked at it and I thought, wow, I took my own advice and I was, I was pretty good. So, but, you know, but to show up with that attitude, if you are an actor, a professional actor, is very difficult. That's why it's so hard to be a, a, a leading person in anything, because you have to, you have to really leave your ambition at home. You have to say, I don't care if I ever work again, because I'm just going to, I'm even uh. either I'm not going to do anything, or I'm going to do something that's so different or so difficult or so kind of gutsy that, I'm going to risk being bad. Some of my favorite actors, I think, have that sort of that easiness that you that they're always being accused of underplaying stuff. It's like Robert Mitchum, I think, is amazing, and he's you know he doesn't seem to ever do anything, and yet. Well, Harry Harry Dean Stanton is an example. Uh, my friend Ulu Grossbart is a great director. Once told we were talking about Harry Dean because he was in a movie of was called uh what was it called with dustin hoffman straight time and oh, that's, a, that's an amazing movie that's one of uh, dustin hoffman's best film great movie well i'll tell you a second amazing about, film uh, uh, that was an accident in a sense so but ulu said about harry dean stanton he said he's incapable of being bad <laughs> right, right right there are people like that our friend sissy spacek uh who we've worked with mm. she can't be bad she's just she can she, she just whatever she does is never bad you can be you can right. be to this or to that, but you're never bad. But straight time, you know, straight time, Dustin was supposed to direct. So here's, and he f kind of foundered, he kind of like, they started producing and started making the movie and he just wasn't up for it. And so he called Ulu to take over. And Ulu took that movie over from Dustin because he was like Dustin's best friend. That's one of my favorite Dustin Hoffman films. It's, it's, I don't think it has a reputation it deserves. It's just utterly brilliant. Harry Dean Stanton's yeah. wonderful in it. Gary, Gary Boosie's in it, I think. You are a walking, talking encyclopedia. I can't believe it. You are, I think you're right. <laughs> Yeah, I think he he is, and there's a there's a actress oh, who's yeah. in it, which he, it might be her first. Teresa yeah. Russell is in yeah. it as well. So it's a really good movie, but how did it get made, and how did it end up with Ulu direct? I mean, it's a total accident, a total accident that Ulu Grossbart mm. is directing that movie, and it wouldn't have happened if he hadn't been best friends with Dustin Hoffman, and if Dustin Hoffman hadn't failed is not the right word, but hadn't stopped directing it. I mean, every how. It's an accident. <laughs> it's a total accident <laughs> when a movie turns out well. <laughs> Not just one accident, but a whole a, 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 a repertoire of daily accidents. You know, something happens and you can't shoot that location, so you shoot in a different one. Something happens and the actor got sick that day, so you had to. It's just it's, it's day in and day out. It's a series of accidents. And that, matter of fact, my favorite de definition of directing was at least attributed to Orson Welles. It, the director is the person who presides over the accidents. That's the best definition of directing. That's brilliant. That's in the but, book. But, I, re I recognize I you. You so. quoted that That's in it. the book. A, 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 a title for your for your next book has got to be a repertoire of daily accidents. <laughs> So, uh, thanks so much for talking to me, Tony. I've got one more last question, um, and then I'll let you go. Um, is there a a book about movies, a, a film book, that you would like to recommend to our listeners? You can recommend any, or you can recommend more than one if you prefer. But is there a book that you've read about the film world that you think, ah, this is this this is the this is one of the books that people yes. should read? It's on my shelf. Can I take a second to go get it because I want to quote it accurately? Yeah, sure. Okay. This. This, I think, is one of the best books about 
the movie business and making movies and so on and so forth. It's called Pictures at a Revolution. Pictures at a Revolution by Mark Harris, who is a great writer. And it, it is relative to its relevant to its period. Um, it's about five movies that were made in 1968 and how they got made and, and you know, so on and so forth. And um, it, it, it just captures a pe the period of time and, and the kind of zeitgeist of, of making movies. Now, it's not really about the daily making of movies, but I, I think it's the most terrific book I've, I've read about the movie biz and movies. The five movies that were made all in 1968 were Bonnie and Clyde, Dr. Doolittle, The Graduate, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and In the Heat of the Night. And they all represent a different style of movie and a different era of movies that, that Mark Harris's claim, uh, you know, his pr premise here, is that, that that year marked a turning point in the making of movies. The, the old Hollywood movie represented by Dr. Doolittle or Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and the new Hollywood being um, Bonnie and Clyde and The Graduate, and somewhere in between in the heat mm -hmm. of the night. So I really love this book. So that's my that's my reading recommendation. Wow, that's great. That was a fantastic book. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, and thanks so much for, for joining us. I hope I hope you you write that next book so I, we can talk some more. Well, I'll have to I'll have to live a whole other lifetime to get the material down like, uh, to, to to write a book about tales from the crew. <laughs> I got to start all over again. So that was me talking to the wonderful Tony Bill. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I had an amazing time chatting with him and uh, we really, really, uh, so many funny things, so many wise observations. I mean, this is a guy who's seen it all. Um, he's the guy who, if he tells you once upon a time in Hollywood is pretty accurate, you can believe it. So all that rests all that rests all that remains for me to do is thank ali howard for the art ellie atkins for the music the wonderful music i love that music and uh thanks to tony bill for talking to me go out and buy his book it's amazing or stay in and buy his book buy it on on online if you wish um great uh, uh so thanks for listening and i'll i'll see you next week i guess unless other things happen but anyway we'll speak soon <laughs>